Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 417 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, we are starting a series called More Than a Maker, which focuses on the intersection of mental health and creativity. The series is not about putting these artists forward as experts, but more folks that have first-person experience with finding balance when dealing with issues like addiction, anxiety, depression, and other things that are unfortunately a part of the life as a 21st century human. In this first episode, we talk with Mac McCusker, who is a ceramic artist based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They make sculpture and vessels that provide social commentary on the rise of bathroom bills and other issues surrounding the LGBTQIA community. In our interview, we talk about addiction and solutions that Mac has been able to find for that, as well as art making as activism. If you're interested in seeing examples of their work, you can go to MacMcCuskerCeramics.com. Before we get into the interview, I did want to share that addiction is something that has been on the show before, or at least it has been a topic that we've discussed. Back in Season 9, I talked with Dr. Melissa Weimer in Episode 329. She's the Medical Director of the Yale Addiction Medicine Consult Service and is an expert in the medical intervention of addiction. If you have someone in your life that's dealing with addiction, whether that be you or a family member, I feel for you. This is uh, something that I've dealt with for the last 20 plus years of my own life, and I'm fortunate to be in recovery. If you need some help, I'm glad to help you, and I can share the solutions that have worked for me. You can find me on Instagram at Carter Pottery. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's actually start there. Can you talk about your general mental health throughout your life and then how that paralleled your creativity as an artist? Well, let's see. I had a fairly rough childhood. Um, My father died of AIDS in 1987, which kind of rocked the family. And um, no one wanted to talk about it, of course. It was in 1987, so it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. And, you know, if you got it, all of a sudden there were lots of stereotypes about people who had AIDS. And so that was a really kind of rough upbringing. And, and uh, my uncles used to make us cocktails at, at 13. I was 13. Um, and, you know, they thought it was cute. Like they let the kids get drunk, you know. <laughs> and then at 16, my mom started buying us alcohol because she thought we would drink anyway. And, um, you know, she wanted to kind of control the environment. So I, I started drinking fairly young, but um, it wasn't really a problem until my 30s. I, uh, I was always so busy. At, in undergrad school, and I usually had a couple jobs. Um, so I had that constant, probably mania going. Um, and uh, I was able to not do, I mean, I drank certainly, but it was only on the weekends and it was usually like a, a binge. And then I would be fine Monday through Friday. Um, so, but in my 30s, for whatever reason, um, I quit my job. I started, you know, I started drinking every day. I moved to Atlanta with no job, just figured like, you know, just a lot of crazy. I started smoking. <laughs> just a lot of crazy decisions at 31 and uh um just kind of went downhill from there I just started doing harder drugs and harder and harder and just kept falling down and but after I got sober um well when I tried to get sober um and they started medicating me it got a lot better um but it probably took me a good two years to get continuous sobriety and uh that that first year passed yeah but it's okay now that dual diagnosis of bipolar and addiction or alcoholism is tough because the cycle of bipolar, when you feel good, why would you do anything? Because you feel good. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, he said, I've been self-medicating for a long time, you know, uh, cocaine when I was down and alcohol when I was up, you know, or pills, <clears throat> pain pills or something when I needed to come down to go back to go to grad school. I mean, I was in grad school this whole time and 
um, teaching and had a 4.0. No one had a clue. So it was just really interesting. <laughs> that that double life, I think, is common for addicts, you know, because part of the defense mechanism of it all is like, I can't look like I'm hurting as much as I am. You know what right. I mean? So like put the put the face on, put the the mask on, you know, we talk about in recovery, like we wear masks to to hide those things. But I think for you as a figure sculptor, I think that probably is literal, you know, like, like you have sculpted the figure, either a per personification of yourself with self portraiture or previous work. I was, I was actually looking back at previous work and, and animals, it seemed like were, were the topic of a lot of sculpture around then. Can you talk about kind of the pre self portrait stuff and how that addressed, um, the things you were interested in? Uh, in, in, uh, grad school, I started I did my first self portrait in undergrad and then uh I did two in or maybe three in grad school and it was talking about um religion and how it affected people of color uh people with different religions people who were gay etc and uh, I was it was called in the name of god it was a pretty intense show um so that's when I started doing that and I did my uh, uh a self portrait as me of Joan of Arc because Joan of Arc was actually tried for, for heresy, but they didn't convict her for it. They convicted her for wearing men's clothes. So it was about her uh, dress and her gender really expression that uh, got her uh, burned at the stake. So, uh, so that kind of started it. And then when I, I came out as trans in 2009, the same time I got uh, uh, committed to rehab, I, I went in voluntarily. Um, and when I did that, uh, I, didn't want to talk about it. You know, I, I thought that was a very private thing um, and didn't really think anybody interested. In, and, and I was almost had a little shame around it, I think. Um, so I started teaching college in Savannah after grad school. And my, my uh, colleague, he used to be my professor, sculpted the figure. And he, uh, so I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to be competitive with him. He was a little competitive. <laughs> um, so I started sculpting animals uh, just, just kind of for fun. And uh, I actually did a show about me being bipolar too um and it was a little bizarre it's not one of my more successful body of work but uh um yeah then i started doing the animals and i, I really enjoyed kind of the capturing emotion in in the animal i think a lot of the ones that i have like you tell in the eyes they're just like uh pretty personified of human emotion um but then the bathroom bills happened and uh i didn't even think about it i just sort of like i'm gonna make a piece about this because i was so mad and uh i Thinks I don't know who who noticed it first, but somebody saw it and it kind of just catapulted me into the spotlight. And I applied to speak at Instica and got it, and that kind of went on from there, um, being asked to talk and stuff. But it just it was all of a sudden it wasn't any kind of gradual thing. Um, and I you know I've, I've done the animals for quite some time, and they don't ever show. <laughs> they never got into shows, but they sell, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, vice versa. Uh, the sculptures in the trans series, not one has ever sold, but they show. Well, we're we're going to talk about the trans series, but I, I want to back up and talk a little bit more about the, the reco recovery equation, or at least the equation for you. In my experience, I've seen a lot of people that they can't stay clean until they come out or till they transition, you know, like that is like intimately linked. And sometimes I've worked with people either sponsoring them or, you know, just friends in a home group or However, people in the recovery community, and I can tell like this is the speed bump that they cannot get over, you know? So can you talk about putting that together in your own life, like transitioning being a way to find a, a, a sense of a true self and that being part of the mental health picture? I didn't know what trans was for a long time. Uh, I knew that there were transsexuals. They weren't transgendered, but didn't, didn't really exist when I was younger. Um, I always knew that uh, I was different, but I never put two and two together. And when I went to graduate school, I met some trans people and I met several um, uh, female to male people and uh, they were in my recovery groups uh, when I went to, to AA. And um, uh, I, when I met them, I just was like, oh my God, that's, that's what I am. And it just sort of made sense to me. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time and she was like, I really think you're, you know, I really think you're trans, but it took other people kind of put it projecting that identity on me for me to really recognize it because I was terrified. Um, and I think I was still somewhat using at that point, but not, not a lot. Like once I, once I got out of rehab, I really wanted to get sober. 
Um, so, and that was when I came out as trans to, to uh, my sister. They made me call a family member before I left and tell them like why I was in rehab. And so I, I did. And my sister was like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> 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 but uh, the, the problem for me was um, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to financially afford the, to have stop surgery. It was, you know, it was eight thousand dollars back then, and you know, it just the insurance didn't cover it. Um, so, I kind of tried to make peace with the fact that I was never going to fully transition, and just tried to, you know, wear binders and do the best I could to just sort of look androgynous. Uh, but it it took a toll on my mental health because, you know, you're there's no way you're going to be gendered correctly when you don't look the part, and so. It, it, I think that's part of the reason it took me a while to get sober, um, to, to, you know, to stay sober, because I just kept being just really unhappy, you know, and uh, I was sober for, I think, a year and a half. I'd made it a year and a half, and I was moving to Asheville. I got a residency at Odyssey Clayworks, and I got a check from the college. They had my own pension or something like that, I guess, and it was $7,000, and so I was like, oh, my God, I can you know, I can do this now. And, uh, and it was amazing the difference that it made. I mean, it, it instantly I was just like, you know, this, this is who I am. And even just, I wasn't even on hormones then. It was just having the top surgery that, that, you know, was it, I mean, it was a catalyst for me becoming a better person. Yeah, man. What, what, what a blessing to have, <laughs> have a job end up being the thing that's kind of saved money for you that you didn't even know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny because uh, I was doing trans work. I wanted to do trans work in college, but I, I had a, a re weird relationship with the administration. They didn't kind of get it. I was gay, but for whatever reason, being trans was a little more difficult. Um, and so I mentioned that I wanted to start doing some figurative work of trans people, and my uh, colleague said, "I mean, Mac, do you really want to be known as that trans artist?" <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious to me now because I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what I am and it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just different. I mean, that was in 2014, 15. And it, you know, it's amazing how far we've come since then. Uh, it, and it's not been an easy journey, but uh, you know, at least trans women for the most part are in a little bit more in the public eye. Trans men are still really not, um, which is why my, my, my next series is sculpting trans men because we're sort of invisible, you know. As you're talking there, it made me think about the role of celebrity. You know, I think trans women, there, there are some relatively famous. I mean, it's, celebrity is a weird thing because as soon as you get famous for one thing, then you are pigeonholed as that thing. But I still think that there's more visibility for trans women. So do you think it's going to take a celebrity that's a trans man to be able to I mean, it's it's weird that it's as superficial as that, but I kind of think it is. <laughs> it's probably a little bit that. I mean, Chaz Bono, uh, a share son, did that, and and the, not much attention was was put on him at all. Um, I think it's partly because there's such a stigma against people, who, gay men especially. Um, a lot of people don't have a problem with, with with lesbians, you know, and so a lot of people I don't think have a problem with the fact that. Uh, maybe sort of butch lesbians transition into, into men. Um, but they have a huge problem with, with men becoming women, you know, it, it emasculated, it, it emasculated them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just think, cause you know, they're the ones that are getting murdered. They're the ones that are in the, in the public eye. And uh, you know, when a straight cis person is attracted to a trans woman and they don't know they're trans, you know, it's immediate violence. Um, whereas I, I don't really see that, with trans men and most of the trans men I know are, are fairly out about it, public about it. And, you know, not to say that's not difficult life, but it's, it's definitely easier, I'm sure, than um, being a trans woman. You did a piece um, that was called A Little Worse for the Wear. And it's a, mm -hmm. a piece of you, you're, you're sitting, leaning forward, and the t-shirt the that you're wearing is, is both ripped and you're sewing it back together. And I thought that that, that was the first, I think I saw that piece in person. That was in Asheville, right? That was at Odyssey. Yeah. 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 I think I saw that piece before I actually met you. So when I, I was walking around the studio and I saw that, and it's such a descriptive um, act, you know, to, to re-sew something that you're wearing. You describe it on your website as being an, uh, that there's so much self-repair that's needed when you're rebuilding an identity or maybe 
solidifying in that, however you would describe it. But can you describe that piece more and then talk about what that means for you or what that represented emotionally? It kind of represented a lot of things. I mean, uh, my family had a, a fairly difficult time with the fact that I was trans. Um, they had a difficult time with me being gay as well. Um, but uh, I suffered a, a fair amount of abuse for it. And not just from family, but from, you know, strangers, from people I knew, from people who I thought were my friends, um, from the ceramics community. I even got some backlash from the ceramics community. And um, people asking really inappropriate questions, you know, and I was having to talk about myself a lot. I couldn't talk about my art without talking about myself. And it just really put me in the public eye and really put me as a target for both positive and negative. And, you know, I got a lot of young people messaging me on Instagram, uh, asking a lot of questions and, you know, wanting some support. And, and that was really good. And I really appreciated that, but it, it's also takes a toll on you. Um, and I think it was more the abuse I was really getting on social media that just finally was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I was like, you know, I'm kind of breaking you know, and I felt like I was falling apart a little bit and I didn't really know how to react to it. I mean, people always say, don't read the comments, but you can't read the positive comments if you don't, you know, you don't read the comments. Uh, and it just, it just was really hard. And I think uh, I was actually talking with a friend of mine and um, we were talking about how I could express that. And we both kind of came up with that idea of uh, just having the trans symbol on my shirt being ripped and uh, generally trying to put those pieces back together on a daily basis, you know, kind of building yourself back up, your self-esteem back up, your confidence back up to face another day. Yeah. And, and I think for the most part, the, in that piece, I think the trans symbol is being repaired and uh, I don't doubt my trans identity, but I do sometimes doubt the ability to be accepted as trans. And I mean, there's also just the, the progression of, a person in recovery figuring their shit out. <laughs> yeah, Do you know sure. what I mean? Like if you if you have 18 months clean or sober and you're, I mean, your brain is still pretty fried at that point, you know, much less dealing with abuse, family stuff, all that stuff. Like there, there's a lot going on in our heads <laughs> where we're trying to put things back together. But when I saw that piece, me as someone in recovery, I could relate to that, even though the subject matter was trans identity, I related to it as identity. I mean, I think we're, we're for me, I understand our identity is I'm always looking backwards to figure out my identity. You know, there's some like sense in hindsight, I can figure shit out. But in the moment, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Totally. Uh, I don't think I realized at the time how hard it was. Um, I mean, I knew it was hard, but I don't think I realized exactly the toll it was taking on me. I, I was really isolated from community. My uh, partner left me when I started transitioning and I moved to Bakersville of all places uh, <laughs> next to Penland. So it's a town of 326 people. I lived right across the street from the Confederate Memorial and uh, it was mildly terrifying. And I, I looked, I had just started hormones and uh, I looked really androgynous. And so I was constantly getting asked, you know, what are you? Are you a boy or a girl? And I really hadn't decided to, to what, how fully transition, I guess you would say. Um, I really wanted to kind of stay in that androgynous look. I, I, I think of myself as more non-binary and, uh, but it was, it was frightening. You know, I, I really thought I was going to get beat up. I thought someone's going to hurt me. So I just was made the decision, a conscious decision at that point to up the testosterone and, and, you know, look like a male. And uh, it was a relief. I have to say, you know, to at least appear as, as one thing and not both, but, uh, it was a, it was a tough decision I had to make, um, because, you know, you can't go backwards once you, once you start this process, it's permanent, you know, but fortunately, you know, I like myself, uh, and I liked it when I, when I, uh, started looking different and, and I like myself now. Um, I don't think it was a mistake at all. So there's that. <laughs> Testosterone is something that shows up in the work. You know, there's um, some functional pots. There was a, um, a set that you did about, about uh, testosterone in that process. Can you talk about going through the physical process and then thinking like, I got to make art about this? Yeah, uh, I, I just think um, for me, it was really hard to find information about being trans in general. 
and uh, I was transitioning alone. And I took a lot of self-portraits at that point to kind of record that process because I didn't have anyone to bounce, you know, my appearance off of. And uh, I didn't know how to give myself a shot. I didn't know how to do any of that. There was no guidance for that. So I learned it from YouTube and from watching Instagram videos, you know, and I and it no one told me how to do the, the perfect little flick of the wrist with the, <laughs> with the needle so it wouldn't hurt. You know, so it was painful every time I had to do it and you have to do it once a week. And uh it was just, it was a process of sort of learning that whole thing. And it was, it was a lot to deal with by myself. And um, I, I began to get a little sense of humor about it, I guess, uh, talking about testosterone and um, just the, I guess the toxic masculinity that is out there. And uh, I always kind of thought myself, um, I hate to say that better than a, a cis man, because I've lived both experiences, you know, I've, I've had the female experience and uh I feel like I know better how to identify with, with both genders. And um, so it just became a little, a little funny to me. Um, and I thought uh, Kathy King actually was, was uh, going to jury a show called um, uh, narrative functional narrative function or something like that. And so I was like, you know, what can I make to, to get in that show? And I thought about the, the teapot, you know, and it, it being, you know, the tea for testosterone and uh, you know, what could I do to illustrate that? um that whole process and it, you know I really had fun doing it it was really fun to do that the stackable teacups into the syringe um and then the the teapot that was a testosterone bottle yeah and I, I think a lot of the public maybe wouldn't quite understand that that you are administering the shots yourself so it is a an ongoing process that you have to keep up with it's not like you get one shot and then you're done no no you have to maintain that I mean the dosage eventually went down. Like once you um, kind of get the effects, I guess you're going for, um, you don't have to stay on a high dose. And so my dose is, is fairly low now just to sort of maintain what I have. Um, but it will be something I have to do forever. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of laugh at the fact, am I going to be 80 years old still giving myself a, a, a you know, a testosterone shot? I hope not. <laughs> I hope I won't care by then. Uh, I mean, some of the effects are not permanent. Um, uh, if you, if I were to stop tomorrow, I would eventually get hips again. I, my body fat would relocate back to a more feminine uh, appearance. And uh, um, the hair on your face will get softer, but you see, you will always grow that. You know, the hairline's not going to come back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's some minor changes that that would happen. You know, and if, uh, if you are still a person with reproductive organs, then you would get a menstrual cycle again. I, I don't have that anymore, but... Uh, um, things do go back somewhat and, and, you know, and so it's, it is something you have to take, you know, as long as you want to maintain those physical characteristics. Does testosterone affect bipolar? Like, was there any issues mental health wise because of that? Yeah. Interesting enough. Uh, I, when I moved to Asheville, I didn't have insurance. And so I was on bipolar medication. I ended up having to wean myself off because I couldn't afford the, the medication anymore. It was like $2,000 a month or something. And, uh, that was about the same time I was starting testosterone and I was fine. I, I mean, I had no relapses, no mania, no nothing, um, no depression. And when I eventually started exhibiting some symptoms, again, it was about a year and a half. And I went to the, the doctor and uh, the psychiatrist and, and she said, testosterone is a mood stabilizer. And so that process of, of doing that for that year until I got used to it, stabilize my mood. And I thought that was so interesting uh, that, you know, it, it could do that, but it did. And, and, you know, it was only much later that I had to get on uh, bipolar meds again. It was a low dose. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. More Than a Maker is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana, proud sponsors of Wellness for Makers. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana is focused on building healthier communities through strategic investments to improve population health, increase access to care, and to make health care more affordable for all. For more information, please visit bcbsmt.com. while you're in, in North Carolina, the political situation goes downhill pretty quick. <laughs> you know, the, the North Carolina legislature at that era was one of the most conservative, regressive 
political units in probably in our lifetime, I, w- I would imagine. And the bathroom bill happens, and all of a sudden, it's like you're literally under attack. So could, yeah. can you talk us through that? When they first happened, uh, I, I recognized that. I, I was driving, and I heard it over the radio that there was this new bill. And um, that it was targeting trans individuals. And I was immediately terrified that I was going to get, you know, harassed in a bathroom. And, and I did multiple times. Um, and I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I started being afraid of going to the bathroom. I traveled a fair amount. Um, and so stopping at rest stops became a terrifying experience. You know, I, I still somewhat looked a little feminine, but I did start having a little bit of facial hair. So I, people still were kind of confusing as to what I, uh, what I was, but I was still using the women's restroom at the time. Cause I didn't have any, I didn't have that much facial hair and uh, I still looked a little feminine and I got uh, multiple times women screamed when I, when I came in there, but I didn't think I was appeared masculine enough to go in the men's room. And the, high, the whole idea of going into the men's room was, was also terrifying because I thought, you know, they're going to peg me immediately. And, and, you know, I don't pee standing up. <laughs> so um, it just it just was I don't know. Uh, I developed bladder issues because of it, uh, because I was just so afraid to go to the bathroom. I stopped going. So now I have stage two bladder trabeculation um, from a bathroom bill. I mean, you know, from a legislative bill and. Uh, there's, there's many people. Apparently, bladder infections are, are uh, very common among trans people. So, um, yeah. And then when they repealed it, only last year that they, I think, are started trying to repair that bill. But to my knowledge, nothing has been done about it. You know, and, and again, like, how are they going to police that? You know, are, are they going to start checking your birth certificate when you, when you walk in a public restroom? And I read a lot about, um, you know, other people looking for trans people, you know, in bathrooms, because, you know, we're everywhere. <laughs> we're like 1% of the population, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of butch lesbians were getting beat up. And uh, it, it wasn't so much the trans men, because a lot of us pass, you know. Um, and, and, you know, trans women are, are of course, targeted. So it just became a, a, just a, a sort of frightening experience just to, just to exist, just to travel, just to go to the bathroom. Starbucks became my friend because they have gender neutral bathrooms. <laughs> so there's a, there's an app on your phone you can do called rest, uh, restroom refuge or refuge restroom that actually tells you where gender identity, uh, gender neutral bathrooms are that I've got on my phone that helped a lot. I, I feel like the people that are the actual politicians, they're doing this for power. Like it is just for their own power. And greed, Absolutely. usually. Usually there's some donor money that's affecting these things. But there, the real life re- repercussion is, is it opens trans people up to violence, direct violence. And actually, this is happening now with, with abortion bans, with these, these um, headhunter clauses, where basically anyone can sue someone uh, that's seeking an abortion. And it's yeah. basically just like giving the mob the ability to attack people either legally or physically. It makes no sense. It, it's, it is not a societal norm that I think we want to push forward, but it's happening. Yeah, and the same thing's happening with the don't say gay bill and, the, and then the, uh, the, the bill in Texas that are making it a criminal action if you let your child transition before they're 18 or even even take puberty blockers which it does not harm anyone it just it just delays puberty from happening um yeah you can be prosecuted and and, and tried for child abuse if, if you if you allow your kid to to be themselves to live authentically and you know a lot of these kids are suicidal and you know if you you're literally putting your child in danger by not you know respecting their their wishes so uh I've had way more people contact me on Instagram and Facebook just because they're scared, you know, and want to know if I have any advice, I guess, or really just a vent. I think afraid because of, uh, afraid that for one thing that the, the bill is going to be uh, repetitive and that it's going to go and it has, there's like six other states that are now considering that bill um, and that it's going to, you know, directly affect their life. And also that, you know, they, they just won't be able to, to transition and, you know, it's putting the parents in an, an incredible predicament, you know, do you, do you risk being, 
you know, tried as a child abuser or do you, you know, help your child? And um, it's, it's, it's terrifying because, you know, so many kids attempt suicide when they can't come out because they've just, uh, I mean, I did that, right. But that's what landed me in rehab was a, a suicide attempt. And, you know, I just, it, it I don't know, it hurts because I know what that feels like and, and, you know, and why people care. I don't understand, you know, that it, that this is a topic that, that they've targeted trans people in general, you know, 1% of the population because of religious reasons, you know, it's just insane to me. I don't understand it. One of the ways you you've been sort of forced to interact with the government is, is changing your name because when you change your name, it's, it's an official legal thing. So you did a piece called what's, I think it's called what's in a name. Can you, can you describe that piece and then, and then talk about where that comes from in your experience? Uh, it's me standing kind of presenting my driver's license to someone. And uh, I did that piece a, because I was in the process of changing my name and it was really complicated. Um, B because even after I transitioned, I, I transitioned before I changed my driver's license. So my driver's license still had my dead name on it and it still said female and I got pulled over and, and uh, it was in um, Burnsville and uh, the cop basically clocked me and, and said, you know, Miss McCusker. And I was just, you know, what is it, what is he going to do to me? I, I mean, I was scared. And fortunately he didn't do any, do anything other than, you know, make a joke about it. But uh I don't know the, the idea that if I, if for some reason they, they targeted me to, to be mean um, and took me to jail, they would put me in the men's prison. If I have the gender marker male on my driver's license, if I have the female, then they're going to put me in, in the female prison. There's nowhere for me to go that I would actually be safe. Um, so I, I, I just sort of opted for the, the most, um, the easiest route would be if they don't know that I'm trans, which, which means change my gender marker on my driver's license. And so I, I did that. But the, the changing of the name process was uh, incredible. I mean, it costs money for one thing. And uh, you have to go in front of a judge and basically explain why you want to change your name. And she actually asked me if I was trans, which you're not supposed to do. Um, and I had and I had to basically say I actually said, no, I'm not, because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want them not to let me change my name. Um, so, and then, you know, on top of that, it's changing your bank accounts. It's changing your electric bill. It's changing, you know, everything that had your name on it. You know, I was 36. I had 36 years of, you know, having another name. So it was, it was a really long process. I still get mail with, with my dead name on it, you know, and it's just something I have to deal with. It, I, I've never thought about how spam mail, junk mail, they're going to keep sending you mail for the rest of your life. <laughs> they are. <laughs> God, junk mail, man. If, if you ever need to find someone in the world, the junk mail companies will find them and send you that nonsense over and over and over again. <laughs> they will. They will. You know, yeah, it's funny because now when I get the mail, like especially when I have roommates, they're like, who's that? <laughs> Is that your sister? <laughs> I'm like, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you know, we're we're talking about all of this this activism that that you've ended up having be a part of your artwork. But let, let's back up and think about the broader topic. Like, did you kind of been forced into being an activist? Did you want to be an activist? No, no, I, I wanted. Uh, I mean, yes, I wanted to be an activist, but I didn't want to be an activist this public. You know, I wanted to do my part in you know changing the world, whatever that may be. Um, but no, I didn't want to be on, I didn't want to be the face on the cover of, you know, transness, um, and be the token for anytime anybody wants to talk about trans identity or gender identity, I'm the one they call, um, which has been both a, a good and a bad thing. You know, I mean, I'm glad that they're asking someone to talk about it. Um, but no, I had, I had no, no goals whatsoever to, to, um, I didn't even want to do that kind of work. Um, I just, I just kind of wanted to be, to be myself and, make that transition and then just live sort of a normal life, whatever that looks like. Um, but I was so mad about the bathroom bills and I was so frustrated that, that my very private life was now very public, you know, and I, I made it more public, but you know, I felt like someone had to. So uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, definitely not my intention, but I'm glad. I mean, I'm, I don't regret it at all. 
Do you feel like that activism is a cathartic process or do you feel like that it, it is stressful? It's both. Um, I really enjoy talking to people who want to hear me talk, especially young people. Um, but it's exhausting. And, you know, depending on the audience, I, I edit what I, what I'm going to say, you know, sometimes I get really personal and I'll talk about suicide attempts and I'll talk about the, you know, the, the sadder things in my life. And sometimes I just don't feel like talking about it. So I, you know, I, I talk about what's necessary to talk about. Um, but yeah, that part can be fairly draining, but I, I just got a message on Instagram. Uh, I think it was last week and it was someone who saw me talk at Nsika and said that they would have never transitioned had they not heard Mike McCusker talk. I mean, how amazing is that? You know, it made me, it, when I hear stuff like that, it makes me know that it's worth, it. it's worth the, the negative stuff that comes with it. I got chills. From <laughs> now, I mean, I think about the power of identification. I mean, we, we, we kind of know this from the recovery context. When, when you hear your experience coming out of someone's mouth, that is a profound sort of soul shaking thing because then you're not alone. You know, and yeah. I think what you're doing, I mean, you're, you're doing public facing activism with the work and the lectures you do and all of that. But the activism of answering someone's DM on on Instagram like that. Thank you for doing that. Oh, yeah. I, I try to I actually have answered every single uh, message that I get. I feel like uh, what would that person feel if I did not answer them? You know, and it, it also keeps me sober and it keeps me um from attempting suicide anymore, you know? I mean, I, I, I don't just do this for me, but I do this because people are watching me, you know? I mean, what chance does, you know, a 13 year old have who, who wants to go through this, this whole transition in life have if, if I can't do it, you know? I mean, and I have all this privilege um, and I am in the public, you know, and I, I have a fair amount of success, you know, it, it just, it would, it would devastate me if I, if I was, that kid looking at someone else, you know, I mean, and, and there have been, you know, your superheroes do commit suicide. I mean, it happens, you know, and uh, it's just, it's traumatic and it really makes you question whether or not you have the ability to, 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 to live, you know, to do what's necessary. I wanted to end talking about hope, how, how you create hope in yourself. And also like, what are the things that you do to take care of yourself mental health wise today? Uh, I actually quit going to AA meetings for a couple of years. And um, when I moved to Pittsburgh, I knew that I could walk into any Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and I would make immediate friends, that I would be welcome in any room. And that's a wonderful thing about AA is you can go anywhere in the country and go to a meeting and you know there are people like you and you don't have to explain yourself. Um, so I made immediate friends when I moved here. And that's one thing I definitely do to take care of myself. And it, it has been amazing since I started going back to the meetings. I started actually redoing the steps and uh, sort of processing things that I really haven't processed before, like, you know, family and dealing with things like that. And, you know, uh, my sponsor always says to uh, clean your side of the street. And so you admit the part that you played in whatever the event may be, and you sort of get a, a forgiveness for yourself. And also, uh, a relief that you've done everything you possibly can to correct whatever situation is, is not going well in your life. And uh, that means a lot to me to, to be able to do that. And I think I live better because of that. I think everybody would benefit if they went through the 12 steps, honestly. Um, but I definitely do that. I, I, I have a psychiatrist that I see um, once every three months and uh, have a therapist that you know, is, is good. And I think everybody would benefit from a therapist as well. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I still have to go to the physician every three months to have my blood, le blood level tested um, for testosterone, just make sure it doesn't get too high or too low. Um, and they, you have a, an elevated risk for um, high cholesterol, heart disease, and things like that by taking testosterone. So they test all that as well. Um, so again, that's, that's something I'll have to do. For a long time, but I think mainly my self care is uh, I love my job. I, I took a job that I knew that I would absolutely love, and it's been the best thing I've ever done is to move this move here for me. And uh, I made a conscious decision. Uh, me and my partner broke up because of it, but it's still the best decision I ever made. 
because I knew this was a job that I would really, really flourish. And I, it, I'm with like-minded people. I'm with people. They, the reason I have this job is they saw me speak in, in 2017 at Enseca and they wanted me to come work here. You know, that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, um, it's, it's nice to be appreciated for sure. And that for me was, was my biggest self-care, I think was, was doing something that I knew I wanted to do. And, you know, I go home every day and I do something to take care of myself. Um, whether it be a bath or, you know, walk, I walk everywhere, it's, which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, I talk to friends and that, that helps a lot, but I think mainly it's going to the meetings has, has really made a difference, um, and keeping me sober because, you know, you're only sober for that day. You know, I can only say I'm going to stay sober for this one day. I don't know that I might ever relapse. No one does. You don't know what can happen in your life that may be this pivotal catalyst that makes you drink. You know, I still occasionally want to drink and I go to a meeting, you know, so it's, it's tough. You know, when you think after I've been sober for 11 years, you would think that, you know, that would be completely relieved, but it's, you know, and it's, it is mostly, you know, I don't, I don't think about it very often, but every now and then I'll think about it. I mean, the move to Pittsburgh was rough losing my partner and uh, um, just the, the massive amount of change that, that I've had to go through. I've never lived this far North. Um, people are different. I, I'm used to saying hey to everyone when I walk by and no one <laughs> says hey to you here. Um, my neighbors are not friendly. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's been a, a, a massive amount of change. But uh, again, uh, making friends who have a likeness to you is a, is a big deal. Yeah. And, and, and I love to hear you talk about, you know, you can go, you can go to a meeting anywhere. You know, you can show up in a city you've never, in a country you've never been to with language you don't know. And if you show up to a meeting, you're going to know that people are are, are going to be similar to you. And that for me has been tremendous for me. Like as I moved around, that's been the key, you know, so that I can feel connected even if I'm feeling weird. Because I mean, part of, you know, this whole series more than a maker is about the intersection of creativity and mental health. And I think a lot of times the, the connection it needs to be nurtured. It's a little bit like like gardening or something. You know, like you got to you got to tend the garden. It, it's not like you can just both creativity and mental health. You know, th- they both need regular maintenance. So it's it's good to hear you spell that out like, yeah, I got to do it. I got to do something every single day. Yeah, and and uh even during the pandemic, there was Zoom meetings and that to me was so much fun because I started going to meetings all around the world. I went to uh, several in London and it was just so cool to hear these people <laughs> talk for one thing, you know, but, uh, you know, there was always a meeting at any time of the day. There was some meeting somewhere in the world that you could go to and it really helped my mental health during the pandemic, you know, because that was, just, I mean, it was rough for everyone, but it was really rough not being able to go to meetings, not being able to talk to people that, um, you know, just have that common commonality. Uh, so that was, it was nice. It wasn't the same, but it was definitely a, a, a temporary fix. There's some people around here that, that got clean on zoom and I was at their first meetings that they went to an in-person meeting and they were so freaked out. They were like, Whoa, there are so many people so close <laughs> yeah. to me. What is going on? <laughs> and AA people are very huggy <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and we, we, we do the elbow bump now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can you plug the union project? Cause you, you, you mentioned, um, that you're working there and then also, uh, your social media. So people could get in touch if they want to talk. Yeah. So I work for the union project and it is an organization that is, uh, bridges communities through the arts. That's their slogan. Um, and it has just been one of the most diverse places I've ever worked. It, it does the most to promote diversity, to go out in the community, to, to, meet the people where they are. We now have a mobile clay unit that we're actually going to start going into to the communities, what's called wheel on wheel. No, what is it? No, it's a clay mobile. And it's no, what is it? <laughs> Whichever one is not copyrighted. It's that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they get a, a tremendous amount of grants to, to, to fund these kind of projects that we do. And it's just, I don't know, it's a very rewarding place to work. And um, to know that they hired me, you know, to, to, because if we had that, uh, we had so much in common about wanting to help the community and meet people where they are and provide access to people who don't have access. We have a BIPOC residency here as well. And, um, and that's just been incredible and, and working with artists that I would never get to a chance to work with. Um, 
anywhere else. I mean, I've never been in a place this, this diverse. Asheville was certainly not diverse. Durham was not diverse. Um, so it's been it's been really pleasant to work here. And then my social media is it's a Mac underscore art underscore ceramics. Don't ask me why I did something so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and then I my website is just macmcuskerceramics.com. Well, thanks for taking the time today. It was good to chat. Yeah, it's nice to see you, Ben. I'd like to thank Mac for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with them and hear about their experience. Also wanted to thank the sponsor for More Than a Maker, which is Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana. They support wellness for makers in a variety of ways, including the Big Blue Sky Initiative, which is a multi-part initiative to increase mental health in Montana. You can find out more about that at their website. That's BigBlueSkyInitiativeMT.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag Honor Native Land Initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.